talked about this. They see kids being explicitly taught how letters and sounds work, but not being asked to then connect this enough to reading, not being asked to apply what they're learning to comprehension. In classrooms that are trying hard to get foundational skills right, there may not be enough time devoted to the development of language comprehension and knowledge. So that's inequitable instruction too. So as I begin to wrap up, I want to say just a few things about teachers. As an education reporter, I have spent countless hours in classrooms observing instruction, talking to teachers about what they do. Two big takeaways from that. We ask a lot of our teachers in this country. Good morning. Welcome back to the 2020 Patent Literacy Symposium. In this session, another tool in your toolbox, phonemic transfer analysis. My name is Karen Deary, and I am so, so very excited to facilitate the session this morning for you. I would like to share a couple of housekeeping items with you um, before we actually begin. Um, first of all, the handouts for this session are posted in the Patent Literacy Symposium uh, Schoology folder. They'll be posted under the June 12th folder under this session title. This session will be for uh, 75 minutes long and it is being recorded. So the recording will be available on our Patent YouTube channel um, in the near future. I will turn off the chat feature between participants. You, though, are welcome to chat with me. Any questions that you have, our presenter will stop periodically and ask um, if there are any questions coming in, and I will share some of those with her as time allows. So please feel free. Um, closed captioning should be activated. I will, I will check. Um, but please feel free to um, send those questions to me through the chat. Also, remember to tweet out all of your great learning and your experiences and the excitement that we have around this symposium um, on your favorite social media platform. You can see we'll use the hashtag over my shoulder here, PA, uh, hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. It is my honor and my privilege to bring to you this morning our presenter. This is Elizabeth Christopher, who works out of our Patent Harrisburg office, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself to you all. Hi, Thanks, everyone. Karen. Thank you, Karen. I love seeing your face. I miss being office um, twins with you or beside you, so I, it's been wonderful to see you. Welcome to everyone on. I'm glad to see we have such a good turnout today. I am Elizabeth Christopher. And I am the statewide lead for the Speech Language Initiative at Patton. Um, I'm out of the Harrisburg office. And you're here for another tool in your toolbox. It's gonna be a very fast paced, uh, quick discussion. Um, everyone's gonna be at kind of different levels along the way. So I'm gonna try to help you through that. Um, a full disclaimer or full disclosure is I'm a speech pathologist at heart. I'm a therapist and just like all of you teachers and therapists on the um, call or on the line right now, my intent is that people leave being able to do something. Um, so if we go a little bit slower because we have to go to a little bit slower, that will be our purpose. Um, I'm a little bit better in person at judging the room for that. So we will um, proceed from there. A few things, um, again, like I said, I work for Patton Harrisburg. I'm the statewide lead for the Speech and Language Initiative. I had the pleasure of working on the literacy team until I um, cut back my time to be home with my son. And so on the literacy team, I was um, a certified letters trainer, a Dibbles Next men mentor. I got to work on the dyslexia pilot for Pennsylvania and a couple other things. Um, helping with assistive technology for literacy and other tools like that. I also work on the short-term loan here at Patton. If you're a Pennsylvania educator, please check out our Patton short-term loan. We do have literacy um, resources in there as a trial for assistive technology for kids. So I'll just put that plug in. Um, prior to coming to Patton, I was a speech language pathologist in a lot of different places. I worked at a developmental clinic at a, a local medical center, an outpatient clinic, and an acute care clinic at the same medical center, doing um, evaluations and treatments of all ages, birth to earth. And I was a um, school district-based SLP, and then I was a training and consultation staff member at a local IU. 
Um, so I've been um, jumping around in, in a lot of different environments and I bring that perspective to this session today. Um, prior to coming to Patton, prior to graduating, I, was, I worked as a graduate assistant in two uh, research labs, bilingual language lab at Penn State and um, the Augmentative and Alternative Communication Lab at Penn State as well in my master's program. And way prior to that, I was a Rotary Exchange student and got to live abroad for a year and I am bilingual. So I bring that to this, um, this work as well. I also sit on a couple councils um, and my disclosures are there, although we're not offering it for ASHA, the um, speech pathologist in me, you know, never quite goes away. So I do sit on the School Issues Advisory Council at ASHA, or board at ASHA, and I'm a member of the CACDC. So as you've been coming to these sessions, you have seen um, this little slide a lot, I'm sure, at the patent initiatives. Um, so we are here to support the Bureau of Special Education and help kids get their services in the least restrictive environment possible. So for this next um, 60 minutes or so, we want to talk about a few things. We want to talk about the phonemic differences between languages, discuss ways that you as a classroom teacher, a school psychologist, speech pathologist, or um, a teacher um, who works with kids who are second language learners, ways to determine the phonemes in the student's first language so that when we are targeting phonemic awareness skills or looking at spelling or any of those tie-ins that speech sounds have with literacy, which we know is vast, um, that we can determine whether or not it's possibly a language learning difficulty versus a literacy difficulty. I have um, curated for you and created for you several resources for those of you who may not speak IPA. And um, those are available in the chat window. I did pop in and everyone should have it. Uh, links to Google Drives that have the exact same materials that are on our Schoology account. But that is for you to share and to use as your teams. Um, everything that we create at Patton is open source for you to utilize. And then we'll give you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this analysis. Um, so hopefully you can do it when you get back. And again, I'm just looking to provide you some resources. 60 minutes is not a ton of time to dive too deep into this. So if at any point, especially if you're a Pennsylvania educator, you have any questions about this work, feel free to reach out to me, eChristopher, at patent.net. And that's what we're here for, is to support you through this process. So again, a few norms for this session. Um, as we go through, we will have questions at the end. If anything is super pressing, please feel free to like say, I need this answered now in the chat window. And uh, Karen, you can interrupt me. But um, usually what I have found is I'll answer it along the way. So um, those are the norms for today. So as um, let's start by seeing who's on the um, Who's here today? So I just launched a poll on the, the Zoom meeting. It is a quick, impromptu poll. If I forgot something, I apologize. You can pop it in the chat. Um, I you know, came up with this pretty quickly. But who is here of our 81 participants? It will help me, again, as a trainer, to see who is here and how it can work. I can't submit my thing, my, my. Okay, one of the things with the poll is there's several. There's um, six different. So if you didn't answer all six. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. The last question says the concept of teacher to adults. Concept of transfer analysis. Do 
give you a couple more seconds. Yes, I, I think it might be coming from your mic. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I, it's funny because it changes with the turn of your head. It got louder. Karen, can you hear me now? I can hear you. But we're still getting the same feedback. I think that's a little better. I don't know what you changed. That's better. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Is it better? I think it's better. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna end the poll now. Here are our results for today. So the majority of us are in Pennsylvania. This always helps me to know um, how to direct. We have um, literacy specialists are the majority. Welcome. It's okay if you're really a reading specialist, that's okay too. I had to kind of come up with the term, um, but we do have some elementary and some English as a second language. And I have one of my special, or one SLP representing, so welcome. Um, this might seem very similar to you. And then um, your comfort level of speech sounds excellent. So using it in instruction seems to be the majority right now. So we, we can go a little faster on that. And then um, teaching second language learners, excellent, 66% on. And we're noticing that a lot more, that these students are all of our students. And um, language learning is diverse regardless of if it's L1 and L2 differences, so language one and language two, or dialectical differences come into play as well. And then some people do already know the concept of transfer analysis, so um, hopefully I'll be able to provide you some additional things, and then there's um, the majority no. Okay, so that helps me to see who's here. So I don't know about you, but have you ever sat down and thought to yourself, what are the sounds in the student's first language? Are my errors that the child is making in their um, literacy instruction, are they due to the first language that they're um, speaking? Does it have anything to do with that? Have you ever looked for resources and thought to yourself, what does this symbol mean in IPA and what can I do with it? Have you ever asked yourself, where can I find out more information on languages? I can't give you all of them. There's 7,000 languages in the world, um, but we do have some resources for you that may help along that way. Have you ever thought to yourself, is, is what I'm hearing a disability or a difference? Um, so there's a firm, firm difference there. And as speech language pathologists, we treat children with disabilities and disorders. Um, and not kids with learning differences in that manner. So how can I boost the, my sound instruction in my classroom might be a question that you ask yourself as well. So what I want you to do in the next hour is to find your sweet spot. As we saw in those poll results, we are coming in on varying levels of understanding. And when you do a training like this, it's very hard to hit everybody's understanding levels. So what I want you to do is find your sweet spot. If phoneme instruction is newish to you and you're not quite doing it yet, 
give me, um, give yourself a break, pat yourself on the back and listen, observe and familiarize yourselves with the concepts of phoneme learning that we're going to talk about. If you're already, and the majority of us are doing this, providing detailed phonemic awareness and sound, speech sound instruction in your classroom, start thinking about the non-native speakers in your room. Start thinking about those questions that you have had along the way um, regarding, am I doing this right? Is that sound supposed to be in their repertoire? How can I teach that differently? Were there times where errors may have been due to language learning? And find a language that you want to explore. And then if you're someone who's a literacy specialist or a English as a second language teacher or someone who's really advanced in the concept of phonemes, you present on this all the time, what I want you to do is focus on the IPA English translation piece and the phoneme analysis. All right, so I already popped into the chat window. There is on your Schoology account a lot of resources. It is a huge packet. The packet was designed to be taken with you and used as the packet to do this work. Once you get more familiar with the work, you won't have to use all the tutorials and all those pieces of the packet. But that was really there, so when, when you go back to seeing students, you can do this work right away. I just need to do a plug for my English as a second language or my um, Eng Educating English Learners Initiative at Patton. They have lots of resources. If you do this work, please check out their work on the Patton website. So what we know right now is in Pennsylvania as of 2018, there were 68,000 students who were identified as English um, language learners. And without going into too much detail, that doesn't that is probably less students than actually are because of the way that um, those numbers are calculated. Nationally, of course, there are many um, languages spoken across the um, country in schools currently. So right now, the national trends lend towards Spanish as the primary source. What we're going to talk about today is what do I do and where do I find information on students who may not speak some of these trending languages? Arabic, Chinese, Vietnamese, Somali, Haitian Creole, Tagalog, Hmong, and Portuguese are the ones that are most spoken in our schools um, currently nationally. I want you to think to yourself, are any of these surprising? Let's look at Pennsylvania's data. Now, Pennsylvania's data is very old, the data I could get my hands on. Um, but in 2012 and 2013, Pennsylvania's um, English as a second language data looked like this. So again, Spanish is the primary, or is the um, predominant language. However, then we have Nepali, Mandarin, Arabic, Vietnamese, Russian, French, Creole, Gujarati and Khmer um, and French coming forward. And as we were, as um, I've been doing work with the literacy initiative here at Patton, we definitely are seeing um, these pockets of languages come up. And as we talk about using good phonemic awareness skills and good um, phonemic trainings like Hegarty and some of the other ones that are being utilized in our Pennsylvania schools, the question keeps coming up, how do I know what phonemes to use with these students? So to know about phonemes, we need to start by language. So what is language? First and foremost, ASHA, um, the American Speech Language Hearing Association and others define language as a rule governed behavior. It's a code. And as we um, have been talking about all week, students, may seem to know the code, but a lot of times they need that explicit instruction on the code to be able to use it in the way that we want them to use it. So it is arbitrary. There is zero reason why table is table, except it's socially accepted that table is, those sounds together are going to have the meaning of table. So it is socially agreed upon. It is learned behavior. And there are almost 7,000 spoken languages in the world. Um, the numbers that I was able to find vary between 6,800 and 7,100. So in the code, languages differ by a lot of different things. 
phonology, phonotactics, stress, pragmatics, morphology, syntax, and semantics. For today, we're going to focus on the difference in languages in phonology and phonotactics. For this purpose, we're going to talk about language in these two forms. First language is going to be L1. You're going to hear me say L1. Depending on how the child is acquiring language, if they acquired it from infancy to three, we're going to talk about it as the home language is L1. If they acquired it after the age of three, we talk about it as L1 first language. We're not going to go into those details today, but um, they are interesting to know as a classroom teacher. And then L2 in this case is going to be English. So as you know, phonology is the sounds of a language, the speech sounds of a language. In early infancy, children attend to improve phonemes in their home language. So as we're talking to kids, they are figuring out which sounds in their repertoire or in their brains are important in their environment. And we call that pruning. So they're getting rid of the sounds that have nothing to do with um, what they need. So in pruning, we prune and we figure out the phonemes of our home language. We also prune our home dialect. So depending on where you're listening from, I may sound like I have quote unquote an accent. So dialect is big and even in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is what I like to call a hot mess in dialects. We are very dialectically diverse. So students are in their home language pruning and figuring out what sounds have meaning for them. The big piece is the majority of spoken languages do not contain all available phonemes. There are phonemes that we are possible that are possible for us to produce that we don't produce. And for the sakes of today, we're going to use the number 44 for American English phonemes. I didn't get this information from this site, but I did put a little teaser there that there is an amazing um, tutorial on linguistics that goes through three, four minute lessons. If you're interested, I put that on here and it's also in the reference guide. So as you know, phonemes can be described by vowels and we describe vowels as tense and lax or short and long. Um, or long and short, so height of the tongue, so where, um, where your tongue is, the lip structure, and the front to back placement of the tongue. We also talk about it in consonants, so place, voice, and manner. In English, we have these um, manners, so stops, fricatives, affricates, nasals, glides, and liquids. But there are manners and places of articulation that we do not have, that other languages do have. And when we hear students that have these sounds and are native language speaker, English speakers, we then start to think about them as having some type of disorder. Um, things like lisps are actually um, part of other languages. In English, they're not part of, the lateralization of sounds is not part of American English. So we have manners like trills and clicks in other languages that we do not have in American English. There are places of articulation like uvular articulation and retroflex articulation that do not exist in, other, in American English. In American English, a retroflexed R sound would be treated as a disordered sound or due to a comorbid issue. So the, every um, language varies with their phonemes. So there are, I put up some of the big ones that we like to think about. Phonemes vary size and type. So Russian has six vowels and 34 consonants, but German has 20 vowels and 25 consonants, similar phoneme inventory size. This is going to impact a student who's coming to your classroom to start talking and learning how to pair phonemes with graphemes and spelling and segmenting of sounds when they have different sounds to segment or don't have the sounds that we're teaching. Portuguese has 14 vowels and 23 consonants, a little closer to us. 
And then the one that is always cited every time we start having this conversation is Rotex, which is out of Papua New Guinea, and they have 11 phonemes. So five vowels and six consonants. I'd like to show you a comparison here, and this is an um, International Phonetic Alphabet, IPA, which is a way that linguists and um, speech language pathologists and other providers um, map speech sounds to um, some kind of grapheme or some kind of um, written form. It is a one-to-one -one correspondence, so it does not use traditional English or American orthography or alphabet. It um, has special symbols, so you're seeing that here. This vowel chart shows us the placement of the mouth or the openness of the mouth and the tongue. So front vowels are your E and then back to your back vowels. High in your mouth to low in your mouth, top to bottom, and then the big one I want to focus on is lax, which is kind of what we would call short vowels, and then our tense vowels, our E's, our long vowels. So what you can see is here's the Arabic vowel chart um, on your left and the English vowel chart on your right. And the first thing that might pop out at you is, oh my goodness, there's only three vowels. <laughs> Um, start to think with your teacher hat on how this may impact a student's segmenting of sounds or phoneme graphing mapping of sounds when there's only three in their, um, their native tongue. You will also notice that they are mostly on the tense side. So, and there's a vowel that we have in dialects, but we don't have in our, our register, our normal register. You will see there's a high front, a high back, and a low mid um, central. No schwa in Arabic. So phoneme numbers do vary across languages and they do vary in dialects. So for today, we're gonna to talk about accent and dialect in this manner. Accent is when L1, so language one, impacts L2. So in Arabic, you might have an accent on the other vowels that they do not have because they're carrying the features of those vowels into um, trying to produce American English vowels. Dialect is the difference between native speakers. So if I sound a little funny to you, that's my dialect, not actually my accent. Um, so I'm from Western Pennsylvania and I had to train myself to have an Eastern dialect when I moved here. Um, because our dialect is very distinct. So here's a couple dialect um, examples. I want you to think to yourself, how do you say those two words at the top? And you can click yes and no in your participant box quickly if you want. Um, we're not gonna take too much time on this one, but do you say them the same? Or do you say them differently? It would be no. Okay. So I say them the same, caught and caught. My husband who was raised in North Texas um, thinks I'm crazy. And he does not see why I would say them differently. To me, they are the same vowel. If you are from the western or the eastern side of the state, you may say something more like caught. So it's a different vowel. Here's another one for you. I'm gonna clear it and you can play along at home. What is the final consonant in this word? Is it the same sound as in measure or edge? And you don't have to click yes or no for this one, just think to yourself. So some people say garage and some people say garage, right? So we can say them different ways. And those are phoneme differences. 
it's important as a classroom teacher, why do I go over this? As a classroom teacher, SLP, a provider of some sort, it's really important that you check your own bias when you start this work. So what is it about your speech sound inventory that may make it um, that you're expecting something from your students that um, may not be happening? So I have some on the Padlet that I showed you. This is just some extra credit for those of you who like to kind of watch funny videos and things. There's a great discussion on Vox, um, Vox's YouTube, about accents and dialect. And I absolutely love this one on Asian accents swapping L's and R's. I think it does a really good job of explaining um, positive and negative transfer analysis in very layman's terms. Um, I will advise you there are some um, scenes from Bruce Lee movies on there, so I would be careful about the company that you keep when you watch it, um, but it's, it's pretty clean after that. So we have the phonemes of a language, but then we have the rules that govern the use of those phonemes. So that is another piece of language learning, that when you're learning a second language, you need to learn the phonotactics or the rules that describe how sounds go together. So there are rules, uh, just a few, that I'll go over. Rules for sound order. So we all know that ng is not in the beginning of English words. Um, as I was doing this and talking to my husband about this, he brought up Ingrid and said, well, that's in the front, right? So we do have some things that we borrow and that aren't exactly precise. Then there are rules for sound combinations. So Japanese does not have consonant clusters. Think about how often you use consonant clusters in segmenting exercises or blending exercises or spelling exercises. And if you had a student who does not have consonant clusters, that may um, come out in their production. Telugu does not have any final consonants, um, final consonant clusters. And it has limited constant or constants at the ends. So Telugu, and that I apologize for the error in my um, typing there, Telugu does not have final constant clusters. So a word like nest may be left off. It may come off as ness or ne because they also end vowels and most of the words in vowels. So um, Rules for sound order for Telugu would include ending in M, N, uh, Y, and W. So it's really, really important here to remember that these are not spelling rules. These are rules that govern the in the dark process. This is the sound production rules along the way. So what does this mean for the students that you work with and, and feel so passionately about? This means that the first language may not consist of all the phonemes that you are targeting in your classroom. Um, the phonotactics, so even if it does contain, and we're gonna kind of do a surface level analysis of it, even if it does contain it at the surface level, like consonant clusters or S's and S's, and S's then there may be rules that say that it doesn't have it in the places that we're looking for it like at the end of the words in Telugu. Teachers need to identify the phonemes not present in the student's uh, first language, look at what phonemes from our language are in their repertoire, so what ones have they picked up, and then provide direct instruction on those sounds just like we're providing them in our world, world walls and our consonant charts for other students, but to be more cognizant of needing to do that with students who are language learners. So how do we start visualizing language differences? Again, I'm gonna show you another one of these charts. Um, this is a quick glance chart. We're gonna do a little more analysis here, but this is Spanish versus American English. Again, this is an IPA chart that I um, pulled from um, the American Speech Language Hearing Association's phonetic inventories that they have. Um, it's also in your reference guide. So there is, um, Spanish versus American English. Again, the big piece that you'll see is number. There's a, um, not as many vowels in Spanish as in English. You will also see a tense lax or a, short, or a long short discrepancy here and no schwa. 
And we know that we love schwa in American English, right? It's spelled like 56 different ways. We love us some schwa. So um, schwa is not in Spanish. This is what creates that accent of things like instead of saying bit, we may, see, we may sound like beat when we say it in Spanish. Um, that is that um, transfer. So this is when we take sounds from one language and try to fit it into another. So transferring from L1 and L2 can be described in, these, in this manner. Positive transfer analysis is when speech sounds in one language facilitates the learning of another language. So for example, if I'm a Spanish speaker on this vowel chart, I already have E. E, so I will probably transfer that over just fine and produce it. Negative transfer is when the process of L1 interferes with negative, um, with L2 acquisition. So I do not have schwa. I'm going to try to borrow something in my inventory to make that fit, um, depending on you know, how much I've pruned, how much I hear other sounds, and those pieces. This was first theorized by Catherine Best. It's been really well described in a lot of different ways. Again, that essential of linguistics that I referenced earlier, uh, um, you know, when in doubt go to Wikipedia, I was really taught never to go there. And I find that their linguistic stuff is really, really good though. So um, go to Wikipedia on language transfer. There's also a fantastic book that I'm going to reference a lot. Um, I didn't know about when I started this work. And then when I found it, I was like, oh my gosh, this would have saved me a lot of time. But by biolinguistics, um, there is a book there and it's later in the references on cultural differences. So in that book, Difference or Disorder by um, Steuben Ketzer, it also describes really well a way to visualize this. So again, I had not read the book and new positive and negative transfer through other work and was just really excited to see it kind of spelled out in the book. So this is, we don't tend to sell books again at Patton, but if you have some reading time this summer, I would encourage you to get this book and read it um, and see um, a little bit more. This doesn't have to be in a Venn document. They, they do it nicely in Venn. I had learned it in a Venn prior to the book. So I'm not sure where I learned it, but it's a great look. So if we look at sounds in language one, um, that would be on one side and sounds in language two. Anything that overlaps, again, that's on both charts is the positive transfer. When we as speech language pathologists look at students with um, speech sound, for potential speech sound disorders, the only things that we can determine as possible disorders have to lie in this positive transfer. If it is a sound in English, like the schwa, that does not occur in L1, it's not a disorder because it has to be in both languages. For literacy instruction, if you start looking at students and saying, what's happening? Why are they not acquiring segmenting or blending um, in the manner that I want them to? You need to look at what sounds they have in that positive transfer. And are you asking them to do skills that aren't in their repertoire yet? So errors here can be considered disordered or impaired or true errors in literacy. So again, what does this mean for literacy? Um, I was really excited the last couple years, um, Dr. Kastner will show up in my office um, during a Hegarty training or an ECRI training or another training in um, our office and bring people down and start talking about, okay, explain to them this, this um, language learning difficulty that may be occurring with these students and what they can do. And a lot of times what we're seeing symptomatically from students is constant deletion. So we're starting to think like, why do they not have constant clusters um, or overproduction of certain sounds or using p when I'm asking for b. So if I'm doing like an activity where I'm saying, say pat, now say it with a b, they may not hear the difference there. I may be using their voice to voiceless pairs. 
Um, difficulty with segmenting and blending, we're seeing errors in syllable patterns because of those phonotactics or those um, stress patterns that we didn't get into too deeply in languages. There might be imprecise articulation, so you know what, he just sounds slushy. Well, in some languages, there are something called diacritics, so we say t, but some people may say t with a little more air afterwards, and that is a normal speech sound for them. For us, as speech pathologists, we would say something's funky. Um, that's our technical term, but we would um, say something like that, like, oh, something sounds wrong. They, you may also see use of long vowels for short vowels. And another one that may happen a lot, and as a classroom teacher or a literacy specialist, that inconsistent production. So you're thinking, okay, he had that phonemic skill yesterday, but now I'm not seeing it. What's happening? It might be the speech sounds that you're targeting in that lesson that are impacting it. So it's, it's a way to look at it a little deeper. Again, finding your sweet spot. So depending on where you are, this might be too much. But if you have a lot of students who are second language learners, this is really essential for all teachers to kind of get this concept of phonemic um, skills. So again, as we say, anytime we talk about kids, is there's a couple disclaimers. Not all kids are the same. No two children who know a language will develop in the same way. You may have twins or brothers and sisters and you're like, one is saying everything great and the other one is not. Um, there's, you know, some people are really good at picking up new speech sounds and accents and some are not. Um, when I studied abroad, I was the one not. I wish I knew IPA then, but I had a friend who sounded like a native Portuguese speaker. I struggled with finding the phonemes that were new. Um, so everybody's can be a little different. Both languages always must be consider, uh, considered, I apologize, considered. There's no typical. Right, so you, you may have had one child who spoke Telugu and then another one and they're gonna be a little off. And all the information here is baseline information. It's a place to start. So again, when we look at this concept of negative transfer and positive transfer and where it lies, again, positive transfer is in the overlap of phonemes and negative transfer is the phonemes that exist separately in the other languages, and that's the accent pieces. That's where the difficulties and the speech sound differences lie. So ELs, L's pronunciations of words will be influenced by their own language and the dialect of that language. So just like if you're in another Amer uh, English speaking country listening to me right now or in the Midwest, um, I may sound really funky and I have different vowels. Whenever we were doing international phonetic alphabet trainings across the state, and when I would get to the Philadelphia region, there was a vowel missing from our chart and they would always bring it up. So this is true in languages too. So when you start seeing these IPA charts, also um, know that there may be dialectical differences. We're gonna talk about Arabic really soon. Arabic varies wildly. Um, so if you're, re if you're looking through this and you may be an Arabic speaker yourself, you might think to yourself, that's not my vowels. Dialect also changes things as well. So knowing where your student is from. Um, stress patterns in the language may affect um, their meaning as well. Okay, so what does this look like with um, the phonemes of real languages? So here's a chart. I customized this chart additionally for you. You do have a copy of it. It has a section for the child's repertoire because as children are language learning, depending on when they came, how often they use English and their own kind of abilities to pick up speech sounds, they may have a lot of American English uh, speech sounds already in their own repertoire. 
that may be different. Um, so if I look at this, you will notice as a classroom teacher who's starting to look at uh, perhaps phoneme, I keep using that, but you can use other things, phonemic awareness skills or spelling or phoneme graphing mapping skills, I'm going to want to pick the sounds in the middle here as my start. And that is because I know the known quantity, right? So I always call it like red light, green light when I was an augmentative communication trainer. You know, pick only one thing needs to be hard here. So the new skill in literacy is what I'm targeting. I'm going to pick the sounds I know the child has. So P, P, B, T, D, K, G, M, N, S, Y, or Y and U. And these are written in English orthography for you and then spelled out on the other side. I'm not going to try to target things with the sounds in the other side, the unique phonemes on the American English side. So I might want to stay away from things with f to start with. Um, I may notice in spelling mixing up s and z in this student's repertoire. So again, always analyze in your head, you don't have to go too deep, but once you get an idea for this um, and you have these written, it's pretty easy to just start thinking about it. Um, think about why spelling errors may be occurring. Um, so we talk about this a lot with literacy with that, you know, why do spelling errors occur? Is it because they're trying to think about the um, name of the sound or um, my own son does that all the time? Or, um, you know, is it just they ha don't have that sound segmentation yet? So thinking there, use uh, positive transfer sounds when targeting new skills. Consider the phonemic confusions when assessing skills and use direct instruction for discrimination of skills um, when they're negative sounds. So you might need to teach them where to put the sound in their mouth. Um, how to produce that sound. This is not, when it is a sound difference, this is not something generally a speech language pathologist will pick up for um, IEPs or um, ed special education because it's a difference, not a disorder. But your, special, your speech language pathologist in your school district or your environment that you're working in can help you with how do you teach those sounds um, they're very quick and easy to do, and it doesn't require um, a lot of effort. I just have a couple other examples for you. Here's French. So you'll notice that um, the positive and negative transfer is not, I did flip the English and the French when I was filling these out, but you'll notice it's not as robust and they're kind of similar. Here's Nepali. And you'll notice again, um, sh and z and ya. This is an IPA. Um, so if you don't speak IPA, I do have a lot of resources for you on how to speak IPA. Um, we have no qualms. Or we have no um, thoughts that you may suddenly use it all the time. But all of the resources tend to be in IPA. So we gave you some translation guides here for you. So again, what does it mean to you as someone who uh, provides literacy instruction to students? Know how the student's native language and English may vary. Choose the targets based on the positive transfer phonemes. Um, and analyze the errors knowing what the sounds are in the student's language. The next level then is to analyze it with phonotactics in mind. So start with the surface level of phonemes and then considering phonotactics. So what are the rules in use? And maybe they're impacting it. You don't have to start by becoming an expert in the child's language phonotactics. I would suggest if you see the error, then backtrack and look for the phonotactics there um, unless the student's struggling um, a lot. So again, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, it's Friday morning. <laughs> I've been sitting here listening. I don't know what to do. I'm going to hopefully not too painfully walk you step by step through this process. It's very, very simple. Um, if you are someone who was in that target area of 
expertise, um, please take my resources and teach others. If you are someone that this is brand new, just listen for a second. So as you know, phonemes um, are speech sounds. So how do you represent sounds when you have 26 letters in an alphabet and 44 sounds? Um, in classrooms, teachers are doing amazing things with sound walls, right? And this is for to from Tools for Reading. Patton's um, Literacy Initiative has a wonderful um, video on sound walls, but they're doing really nice jobs of representing the physical placement of sounds and how to do it. We also use the long and short um, nomenclature to discuss it. People who deal in speech sounds all the time also utilize this tool called the International Phonetic Alphabet. And you've been seeing this throughout my presentation. And there's 107 characters and they're matched together um, exactly as I described earlier. So when you read this, you can hear the sound in your head. So again, you saw this earlier, here are the vowels. There is a handout for you um, where I took classroom language, I believe it's handout four. Um, I took classroom language for vowels and, and superimposed it, but here are the vowel charts. So it's beat, bit, bait, bet, bat, boot, book, boat, law, that's a really rounded law, and box. And then our schwa's in the middle. So if you go to an IPA chart to start doing this analysis, it's important to you to know that we represent them or IPA represents them with two um, symbols. So the schwa that we all know, and then this little carrot, which is a stressed, um, in a stressed syllable schwa. All right, so to do this work, um, because I want this to be as most practical as possible, is there's several handouts for you. Handout one is step-by-step -step directions for a classroom teacher to be able to do this. Um, follow those and you should be able to do it. If there are errors in it, let me know, I'll tweak it. It is on, it's a living, breathing document on our Google Drive and I will be changing it if needed. You have a handout with the IPA first, with the assumption that you're going to an IPA chart to get these. So the IPA is on the left side, and then the literacy symbol that we use. When um, speech language pathologists and linguists talk about letters, um, if we're not using IPA, we use quotes. So that's why you'll see a quote here. The dashes, while I know in letters trainings and as being a, having been a letters trainer and in literacy trainings, we talked about sounds and we use um, American English graphemes in there. When you go to these documents, if it's an IPA symbol, it will be in the slashes. I also superimposed the teacher's charts that we use a lot. Um, for English orthography and superimpose that with the IPA. Honestly, this is the one that you should just use. Um, the other one gives you kind of some of the grapheme spelling options and the manners, but this one is straightforward and um, translated out for you so you can quickly look through it. Here's the vowel chart um, that I spoke about earlier. So here are what we would call in classroom language. I took my best guess. I, I put a poll out there for a lot of classroom teachers and you guys talk about vowels in a lot of different ways. Um, so I tried to, um, to do the best I could with the names. It is an open document, so please feel free to change it to your names. Um, and then here is the updated um, inventory chart that I said. So you might be thinking to yourself, how do I even know what these sound like? So I'm going to see these vowels or these consonants. How do I know what they sound like? This is, these are two amazing resources that I would send you to. I think they give you a wealth of information as a classroom teacher. If you start looking, for example, um, at um, the vowel chart or the consonant charts. Spanish has a consonant called a bilabial fricative. I remember when learning Spanish that I was taught it was somewhere in between a b and a v, right? 
Well, it is. And you can see on the chart, it's right here on the, I don't have a way to show you exactly. It's halfway down. It's a B with a little tail. And that one actually is, it's a bilabial V sound. Um, and that chart will let you listen to it. So you can listen to the sounds in the child's charts and then start to put together, oh, that's why he's spelling words with a V that should have a B. Um, that might be that positive or that negative transfer. So step one is find the chart that fits your child. There are lots of places to find these charts. Um, some are better than others, to be honest. Um, One's like, I don't care for the Spanish phonemic inventory on the ASHA site. It does not tell you what dialect. And again, just like American English, Spanish is highly dialectical and highly country specific. Um, but there is phonemic inventories on, on ASHA's website for you. There's also an excellent resource from George Mason University, Speech Accent Archive. It has languages from um, a lot of the languages that you saw on the Pennsylvania data that may not be what we would consider mainstream, um, but things like Gujarati and Urdu, which are far more mainstream than we realize, um, but may not be as mainstream in our, our classrooms. And the last one I'm going to really emphasize is Portland State University has an amazing list of languages. What I love about this site is if you go past the phonology and the phon phonotactic analysis, you get into morphology and semantics, why they're writing the way they're writing and their word order. There's a lot of information on that on that site as well. So step two then, you found your chart, get your English chart out. Take both charts beside each other. There's a couple different ways you can do this. I'm going to use the Venn diagram system. Um, again, not real sure, but I'm going to give the credit to the people who talk about the most biolinguistics. Um, really do great work in, with the Venn diagram. So if um, take a chart like their um, Venn diagram system and start labeling it. So I like to have a consistent label so that if as a school team, we do these like, hey, I'll take Hindi and you take Telugu and I'll take Portuguese and we'll figure this out, then we are looking at charts across. Um, so label the English on the right and left. Place all the sounds that are on both charts in the middle. Place all the unique sounds in English only on the right. Place all the unique sounds in Arabic only for this example on the left. I'm going by um, one by one because if you are newish to phonemes and this concept of um, 44 sounds for 26 letters, um, this may be um, necessary. If this is too easy for you, please use my slides to train others. So here's Arabic. So we have all the unique sounds in Arabic on the left. They will be here circled in red. One thing I want to draw your attention to is Arabic has, so if you remember, constant charts have the manner of articulation down the left side and at the top the place in the mouth in which we produce it. So bilabial, labial dental, dental, alveolar, postalveolar, palatal, velar, and then we don't in American English produce anything uvular at or pharyngeal. Um, ours are glottal. So you will see uvular and pharyngeal sounds, which will sound a little different if they transfer that to our, our sound system. Another thing to note on the Arabic chart that you will see in a lot of charts and I discussed earlier are the funky markings. So you might see something um, like a little circle under the letter or a little V, a little carrot under it. The one you see the most is the H and those are the unique sound differences. So they're really producing a P, but they might go P 
with a little more aspiration. As a classroom teacher, an SLP, a school psychologist, um, a literacy instructor, or a teacher of um, English as a second language, think about how that might impact sound segmentation or writing. Um, if they're adding an extra puff of air, it may sound like they're trying to add a vowel to us. Um, that's when we use them as SLPs, we use these to indicate um, discrepancies from the norm or differences or possible disabilities. But these are normal occurrences in L1. So that aspiration is not abnormal. Again, like I said with the um, lateralization, that slushier sound on the sides of our mouths, that again is normal for that child because it's normal in L1. So look for the diacriticals. They are also on your cheat sheet. So you will notice in Arabic at the bottom of this phoneme chart, which is why I like the um, Asha ones very much, is they describe phonotactics as well and different things from that perspective. Emphatic consonants um, are, it's a different sound system, or it's a different way to produce that consonant. So that may come across where they have a t, a d, a t, t, and a d, d, right? So a little different. And here, grab your cheat sheet then and translate the middle. Only worry about translating the middle when you're starting out because that's really um, translate the middle and translate um, your sides to or your English side to see what's missing. So here is my quick jump at Arabic. Um, it may not be perfect. I think I left k off when I was looking at it. But here are those sounds in the middle. So what you would want to do is you would get a theta. So you would just translate that to the th. So b, t, d, n, m, f, f, v, s, s, sh, h, y, G, W, and L are in there. The big ones for Arabic, again, are the vowels, right? So they have what we would call a Boston A. So it's not an A that is generally on our American English um, quad. It is an A that is dialectical. So it, it's that really kind of long A that we hear in, um, in Boston or Philadelphia or New Jersey. And a long U and one diphthong. But look at how many vowels, that, again, they're missing. If you had a child who dialectically was speaking a different dialect of Arabic, or perhaps has been here, or really, really gifted at picking up sounds, again, in this side, I would write the vowels in the, or the letters in their repertoire. So that's one way to do it. That's the way that I really um, think sticks out to teams that are talking about. It's a nice quick way to pop it across the table and be like, okay, these are the things we need to concentrate in a data meeting. There's another way to do it that might be a little faster as well. And I created a document for you. I don't think it's as visual, but it's a little more functional for a classroom teacher. Um, so you have the IPA symbol on the um, left, the literacy symbol on the right, and all you would do is take the uh, inventory for Arabic and go down and and check, put an X every time they would be in the center of that Venn diagram. So you would just click that, check that off, and then you would have a really good idea of what to target in the classroom. So again, for Arabic, based on our analysis there, we want to look at spelling errors for b and p confusion and k and g confusion because it's a voicing difference, but they only have the um, voice sound or the voiceless sound. They don't have the voiced version. Um, you would also want to look at the positive transfer sounds that I had said earlier. Look at the confusion and then instruct on the sounds below.
All right, again, for wrapping it up, because we want to make this as functional as humanly possible for you as a classroom teacher, is always figure out what the phonemes or phonotactics are in L1. Um, determine which sounds or rules positively go over. So which ones they, you know, L1 has two, so they both have P. Good, we can target P. Use only positive transfer when teaching new sounds. Um, provide additional direct instruction in the sounds that may be missing. Utilize sound charts and walls to instruct the student. As you're looking at sound walls and instruction, we have some resources for you as well. There's been a wonderful resource for years out there called Sounds of Speech by the University of Iowa. They also have an app. Um, and they show places in the mouth. It's a really nice lateral view of the mouth and the tongue. Yes, we know that the R's are not perfect in it. So if you're looking at vocalic R's, I wouldn't necessarily utilize this. Um, but it is really, really a good functionality um, to see how sounds are produced. If you need more information on, again, how to produce those sounds or where to even start, because I understand as a classroom teacher or a literacy specialist, you got a lot on your plate. Um, talk to your ESL provider or L provider um, for insight on language differences. They are very in tune to culture and the community and can help you pro and provide resources. Speak to your school SLP for um, resources. Again, this might be a point where your SLP says, you know, they're not just, there's not qualifications or eligibility for um, specially designed instruction or um, special education for the student, but I can help you figure out these sounds. Odds are you probably have other kids in your classroom with speech sound disorders, especially if you're elementary. Um, so this, these skill sets will help generalization for those students as well. It's like 25 to 50% depending on the age group. Um, consult with your SLP for assistance again and um, reach out when you need. So you might be thinking to yourself, I have like six or seven students in my class with these needs. What do I do? I also created a phonemic inventory for the classroom languages. You can tweak this so it looks just like our phoneme chart. Um, you could put the child's language, Korean, for example, here, or you could put the child's name. And it's a nice planning guide then to say, okay, here are five kids I need to think about. You could even pop in your children with articulation impairments in this guide so they truly have difficulties producing in L1, but you could maybe guide yourself on, okay, these are the sounds I need to do more explicit instruction in my classroom. I keep referencing this. Again, we don't love to sell books. I was creating all these Venn diagrams on my own before I realized that this book existed. Um, so I have an inventory of these. They have a great inventory of um, popular uh, Venn diagrams already created in this book. They are in IPA, so use our resources um, for the translation piece to translate them over, but they're wonderful. You don't have to purchase the book. Again, Patton doesn't love to sell things, um, but if you happen to have a little extra um, time or budget, this is a great resource for the school. Um, the one thing, they do have an excellent website as well where they do have resources there as well on milestones of language. Other resources or books, if you're thinking, oh, this summer I'd like to read some books, they're usually very available in the library. There's some great resources that I would recommend multi multicultural students with special language needs, uh, dual language development and disorders, and bilingual language development and disorders. This one is for Spanish speakers, so they're very good. Another resource I like to highlight that helps you kind of visualize your own phonemic biases that you may be coming to um, this environment with is Speaking American. There was a great website. It was on New York Times. Um, Josh Katz did hot maps where he looked at how we pronounce things like um, caught and caught or Mary, Mary, Mary. 
and mapped it across the country to visualize. Um, in the Patent Speech Initiative, we do this with SLPs when we're, teach when we're refreshing them on the IPA to check your bias. If you're a Pennsylvania educator, you will notice that Pennsylvania is the dialectical hot maps in the entire country. The country seems to agree on things and then Pennsylvania right down the line in Center County just decides that we're not gonna agree on things anymore. Um, this is a great book that he produced based on his website and his work um, out of North Carolina State. If you are someone who's a little more advanced on this information, McLeod um, and colleagues did an excellent summary of 250 cross-linguistic studies of speech acquisition and um, more into those phonotactics, articulation, and the norms there on um, when things should come in. And then here are all the references and resources that we have available for you, things that I cited along the way. I tried to use um, my experiences as a literacy um, consultant and the questions that I had a lot by classroom teachers, but um, the information is also very much available in these other sources. There are a lot of references on the Padlet that I discussed earlier and in the Google Drive. So Karen, do we have any questions? Oh my goodness, Beth. I, we are so enthralled with your presentation. This has been fantastic. And it's funny because you read your audience perfectly before you even knew who they were because I kept getting questions and then you answered them. And people would come oh, back and say, oh, she just answered my question. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> glad. But you have already answered them. People are wanting to know, though, can they follow you on Twitter? I did put in the chat box yeah. at E. Christopher SLP. Yes. Correct. I think okay. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I am on Twitter. I have a personal Facebook, but some people have started following me on there. Um, it's but you follow it through Pam there. Um, and we have some Google Drives and we have some Padlets as well. So, but please follow us on Twitter. If you're a Pennsylvania um, educator, not to exclude, but we do welcome you to our speech and language trainings. I think sometimes people don't feel like they can come because they're not an SLP. Our speech and language initiative is not a speech and language pathologist initiative. We are here to target speech and language across the issues that come upon. So please come. If at all you get home and you, or you are home, we're all home. If you get back to working on this and you have any questions at all, please, please, please reach out to me. I would love to walk you through it. Um, I am very, as you can tell, passionate. I think this is just an easy thing that we can fix and anything that's easy to fix, I love. So it's echristopher at patent.net, okay? Wonderful. Beth, thank you so much. And I, I need to pick up a copy or maybe I'll just walk next door to your office and yes. pick up a copy of Speaking American. Um, and I love that you say that Pennsylvania is a hot mess of dialects because it was until college that I learned that a mango and a green pepper are not the same thing. I, oh. Somebody in the audience knows exactly what I'm talking about. You and I will have a conversation someday. And somebody also commented just the difference in way back in, the, in your presentation, but just the difference in um, saying wash or wash or wash. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. You know, there is no R in wash, but some people don't know that. Um, but yeah, just the dialect differences across even our state are. are yes. We are so grateful for your presentation this morning. I thank you. I thank all of our participants who, who joined us this morning. I'm hoping that you're all taking away great information from Beth. I did put the, um, I, I recopied the links that you put in the chat for anybody who may have um, uh, jumped in a couple minutes later. So you have those. Please go to the folder for today for this session in the Schoology account and pick up the resources. There are great resources in that folder um, as well from Beth's presentation this morning. As a reminder, this session was recorded um, and it will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future. In addition, the Patent Literacy Team will be creating supports aligned to these presentations at the symposium to help maximize the learning for our families and educators. 
As a final note, in order to be eligible for a certificate of attendance or Act 48 hours, participants must have attended the opening keynote presentation, attend one concurrent session per time slot, submit the attendance and Act 48 requests in the Schoology folder each day, and be sure to complete those items by midnight on Friday, June 19th. The next sessions begin at 11.15, and we'll see you back at that time. Beth, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.